Good evening. You're watching Asia in Review. I'm your host, David Day, and we're going to be talking this evening about a fascinating topic that perhaps you know a little bit about, but my guess is not very much. We're going to be talking about the Philippine insurgency, and uh, our guest this evening is Mr. Al Santoli, who is probably the world's expert on the insurgency in the Philippines, and Al has uh, graciously uh, agreed to stop here in Honolulu on his way uh, back to Washington. Al is the CEO of America, Asia America Initiative, a NGO based in Washington with offices in the Philippines. And Al, it's wonderful to have you here, and thank you so much for, for stopping by and uh, agreeing to, to have a little chat with us here at ThinkTech. You're welcome, David. Um, as some of you know, the Philippines has really been a country that has really never been at peace since the Spanish first arrived on its shores. So if you took the, the broad spectrum of history, you would find that um, basically they have, have, have a 400-year history of uh, an insurrection underway. And um, uh, different facets, uh, different groups, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, but I want you to know that we're going to be looking at not only the Philippine insurgency this evening, but we're also going to be talking about what's the solution, where do we go from here, and is there a way that this, this ongoing violence and conflict, particularly in the southern islands of the Philippines, if there's a solution to this. And uh, we're going to turn now to Mr. Santoli uh, to to really provide some depth and insight into this. So I hope you will find this educational as well as very entertaining. Uh, and so, Al, let me start off here by asking you, <clears throat> let's just take the big picture, first of all. Uh, what are the groups that are, have been involved in the, the, the uh, insurgency in the Philippines? Let's just start from maybe World War II. What, what have we got that have been operating and generally in the country as a whole? And then we'll focus in on the southern islands here. Well. There is a variety depending upon the region, the culture, the language, and the social economic conditions. Um, the Philippines is 7,000 islands divided into three regions with three um, main language groups per se, but over 100 languages, many of, many of which are very different than any of the other languages. So where I work, if you were going to do it correctly, in the diversity of communities we work in, we'd have to speak at least eight to ten languages. So the fortunate thing is that since English was previously the uh, language of uh, unity for the country, and then for a while it wasn't for about 20 years, and then starting about two or three years ago, the schools have readopted English as the main language to be teaching in, and also to be um, encouraging the students to use uh, so that in the future you go back to some type of a common language even though you don't forget your original regional or tribal language. So within the context of this, in every region there are different social economic conditions. And the insurgencies come out of culture and economics. So for instance, in places where you find the largest of all insurgent groups, which is the New People's Army, who are communist, who are People's War Maoist type people, meaning that the, the leaders are upper middle class or even sometimes wealthy college students who get recruited and then they go into the mountains or they go into difficult parts of the various urban areas and recruit poor kids with very little education or in some cases in the mountains they'll kidnap kids to become fighters. So this is the New People's Army otherwise known as the right. NPA, correct? Correct. Okay, so that that and we would That's fight. in the Christian areas. Okay. And the Christian areas would be from what? Mindanao North roughly? Well, throughout the entire archipelago. Uh, the NPAs are in every region, uh, including the capital city region of Manila. And in the city? In the city, yes. Okay. And they are also in 
Mindanao, but not in the Muslim areas because the Muslims will kill them because they are encouraging people to be non-believers because as, as Maoists, communists, they don't believe in any form of God. So there is already a division and split that way, but yet if you look at what they're doing, what's happening in respective cultural areas, it is an ongoing and very serious problem that is stimulated by and furthered by rampant corruption and government mismanagement, which causes such insufferable po uh, poverty that this type of radicalism is um, sometimes considered an alternative. Well, let's move from the, the NPA or the New People's Army now. Uh, let's focus in on some of the other uh, insurgent groups that uh, in, have, you know, we've seen operating in, in the Philippines uh, since World War II. What else have we got in there? Okay. In the Muslim areas, um, which incorporates not only Mindanao anymore, but although there has not been signs of much activity, there are over two million Muslims in the national capital region, in Manila. In Luzon, generally, area? And, yeah, Luzon and surrounding areas. Okay. Uh, why? Because of the poverty in Mindanao because of ongoing warfare, because of drought and flooding that's due largely not just to weather patterns, but to the deforestation and the illegal logging that creates conditions of droughts and floods. Okay. And So, um, so who are these Muslim groups? Uh, there are various groups. Um, mm -hmm. The Moro National Liberation Front is the oldest and the most, the most known, although its numbers are greatly reduced today, and um, they are not as active in any type of violent confrontations with the government because of the 90, 1996 peace agreement, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Okay, so that group, the MNLF, yes, they've been around as a as a as a Muslim-based insurgency in the Philippines since when? Since uh, about 1970, okay. around 1970. Uh, before that, you know, going back to the 16th century when the Spanish came. The Philippines was not a Christian country, it was largely a Muslim country, and before that an animist country because the original beliefs of the people, uh, who were mostly all tribal peoples, was nature spirits. Okay. We work with tribal people now, so we, so we understand and um, we, different tribes in the mountains have different uh, slightly different belief systems, but it's largely nature worship. So if we if we fast forward from the 16th century, mm -hmm. when we've got the arrival of the Spanish bringing Christianity, roughly about that time. Yes. And we fast forward back now into the post World War II era. Yes. Other than the MNLF, what are some of the other Muslim insurgent groups that are that are have been or are operating? Okay. There is, this is, gets a little complicated. That's all right. We're here, that's, what, that's why we have a world-class expert here to, to explain this for us. So there is the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. This is the M-I-L-F. Who LF. broke away from the M-N because they did not want to make a treaty with the government, and they wanted full uh, extraction of the southern area from the country of the Philippines, saying that we were sultanates before the Spanish came. We are still sultanates. We have been imposed into a unity with a central government in Manila that we have very little to no contact with, and when we do, it's usually negative. And then they get influenced by some players from uh, North Africa or the Middle East, a little bit. But they are not foreign-driven. It's all local grievance-driven. So this is basically the M-I-L-F, is a this the Muslim secessionist secessionist movement within the Philippines? They want to do a breakaway. Total. The MNLF were for autonomous region, and out of the '96 peace agreement, an autonomous region, which is part of Mindanao, was created. But it is largely um, not well governed because of the problem with 
not very good leadership, uh, and the politics is really kind of ugly, and uh, also the traditional rivalry between the various Muslim tribes and families within tribes. So if you're, if you're looking at solutions, we deal with community-based solutions because the problems really get down to that community level, which is whether or not people can cooperate together. So, okay, so then you've got MILF squared away. And, but is that a radical, violent organization now? Uh, yeah. They still will carry guns and they'll still fight sometimes. But there are elements within any of these groups who are kind of uh, allies of convenience or they're members of convenience who, who can be very violent. So, so this is a, a problem that we have to continuously deal with in where law enforcement is critical, but we also have other things like keeping kids in school because a lot of times the kids that are recruited or join are not more than 13, 14, 15 years old. Is that right? Yeah. Young, young kids like that? Yeah. And there's a reason for it, one of which is they don't fear anything. You know, young no kids... No fear, that's right, no fear, okay. No, they're immortal in their minds, or they don't even... Not so much they're thinking about being immortal, but the idea of death to them is kind of a remote thing. So rather than playing with toys, they get their M16, which sometimes is bigger than them, and they're out there, uh, you know, doing bad things. Okay, so we've talked about, so far in this program, we talked about the NPA, the New People's Army, mm -hmm. the MNLF, mm -hmm. the Moral National Liberation Front, the MILF, the yes. Moral Islamic Liberation Front. Who yes. else, what other insurgent groups uh, have we seen in recent times in, in, in the Philippines? With, okay, there's kidnap groups also. The most... Uh, well known of the kidnap groups is called Abu Sayyaf, who Abu Sayyaf. gave themselves a veneer of being Muslims, but they're really just gangsters. And they're, they're, what they do is not based on any religion, it's based more on how much ransom they can get from kidnapping somebody, which sometimes is shared with the police or the army if people are in cahoots on the kidnappings. Okay, we'll come back to the Abu Sayyaf in just a moment. Mm -hmm. I want to roll back the time. We get the, mm -hmm. the time of the Japanese surrender, and we move into the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, what about this group that we've heard about called uh, the Hooks? Hooks, are they still they around? They no longer exist. They no they, longer exist. They became eventually the NPAs, the New People's Armies. Okay. They were a communist group, but an agricultural, land-based group that actually fought against the Japanese, too. Okay. Everybody fought the Japanese. During World War II, um, a lot of people fought the Japanese, no matter what their political or religious persuasion was. They were was. kind of a unifying force. Yeah, for they, all were these the, they, they brought Asia together against them. Okay. So they achieved their mission in a backhanded way. Um, but what few people realize, this is just a sidelight for people that are history uh, trivia buffs, is that who taught the Vietnamese how to dig tunnels? The famous tourist tunnels now. Oh, you mean the, 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 the famous Coochie tunnels? That who, kind ta of? who taught the Vietnamese? I have no idea. The Japanese. Is that the right? Japanese soldiers who refused to surrender were really good. If you think about the, the horrendous battles that the Americans fought the Japanese in many Pacific islands, they involved caves, they involved trenches, and they involved tunnels. The okay. Japanese are really good at that stuff. And so they taught the Vietnamese communists the art of tunnel digging. Interesting. Uh, very interesting. You are watching Asia in Review, and we're talking about the Philippine insurgency yeah. with the world expert on that insurgency, Mr. Al Santoli, who is also the CEO of a nonprofit foundation based in Washington, D.C., called Asia America Initiative. All right, Al, we, I interrupted your discussion about the Abu the, Sayyaf. Oh, I thought the, it was about the tunnels. No, we're going to... Abu Sayyaf don't use tunnels. Part of the reason is where they are is in the deep islands where the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the sea level. Okay. It does not lend itself to digging tunnels. All right. But that area, this is another trivia, what is the best area for surfing in Southeast Asia? Bali. Bali is good. And a lot of Australians will go to Bali. However, in 
uh, the Philippines. Mindanao, especially around Quezon Beach, which is the Abu Sayyaf hometown area, has wonderful surfing, except no one will go there because they're afraid of being kidnapped. So we were thinking of as a, a sense of social entrepreneurship. Because especially for the he Australians. He has a sense of humor, you know. And, and so, so for our observer, our, our viewing audience, wake up now because here it comes. Go ahead. Okay, for our Australians who will go anywhere to surf, we were thinking of one of the places that they have. We've never seen, I've been there for almost 10 years now, and I've never seen an Australian in the area. But to lure in the Australians, we were going to start marketing, creating and marketing T-shirts that had a guy with a turban and a beard, Right. On a surfboard. Okay. And we would call it the Abu Surfers. The Abu Surfers. <laughs> and this is now this is not a this is not a, a, a counter a counterinsurgency strategy or what however, it? if everybody started making money, even the families of the Abu Sayaf might get into it because they'd make a lot of money off those Australians more than they would make from kidnapping. Okay. okay. Let's so go it's, back. So it's a social, socially responsible counterinsurgency by surfing. Sure. And what we're doing, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is we just want to give you kind of the broad picture of, of what this, uh, this insurgency throughout the Philippines looks like. The, the organization that Mr. Santoli heads up is focused in the, uh, the most radical, the most difficult areas of the conflict in the southern islands of the Philippines. And this is an area where this group, the Abu Sayyaf, have been active. Where they had been active. Had been active. active. Now, let's talk about that because I just saw an article in a Philippine newspaper that made reference to some type of bombing or kidnapping that they thought was done by militants of the Abu Sayyaf. And uh, you, you just used the word had. In right, because they really don't exist anymore. But wait a second. I just saw it in the newspaper, the name Abu Sayyaf. Right, but written by journalists in the capital who are a, a thousand miles away who never go there. Bottom line is that anybody can call themselves one of these names, any criminal organization, or when politicians fight each other over control of an area, because one of the, the real problems in this area is not so much from the insurgent groups, but it's warring families and warring clans that are fighting over who's going to control different provinces. This area, I have to say, is the most impoverished area of so not just the Philippines, but Southeast Asia. The average life expectancy is 52 years old. Okay, so The infant mortality rate is equivalent to the poorest places in Africa. And the UN Development Organization uh, says that the areas where we set up our initial programs are equivalent to Malawi, which is one of the poorest areas in Africa in terms of child, maternal and child mortality, levels of uh, you know, unclean water, and other social indicators. We work in schools that have no chairs, that have no books, 100 kids to a class per one teacher. The teachers don't get paid for, for months, Jeez. often because their salary is stolen by officials of the Department of Education that are in the Autonomous Region Center. And um, there's no clean water. All the kids have worms in their stomach. And the thing that really got me uh, indignant when people were asking me for computers for schools is I started noticing there were no bathrooms of any sort in schools that had 1,000 to 3,000 children. No, no bathrooms. Uh, how about latrine facilities? You no, know, they just do their thing in surrounding area, and then when it rains and floods, and they're barefoot or they're in flip-flops, that's why they all have worms. Okay. So I made, a, I made a rule that I would not provide a computer to a school unless we got in, unless we got in a, at least one seat for boys, one seat for girls, and there was some septic tank, so there at least would be some rudimentary uh, sanitation, because I could not see what good a computer would do to a sick child who could not stay in school because they would always be sick and they wouldn't have the concentration level because they already have severe malnutrition. They've already been traumatized by war and violence, and on top of it, they're sick from all kinds of malaria, dengue, typhoid, 
and they all have worms in their stomach. So we have, in the past eight years, we have dewormed almost four million children. Now, let me That's been one of our emphasis is that if you deworm a kid, it also raises their ability to learn because the worms eat about 30 to 40 percent of the, whatever nutrition is in their body. And if by the age of seven or eight, if you haven't developed certain parts of your chemical structure of your brain, your whole life you, you might be affected and not be able to learn because you're going to have that, the issue of your brain is not fully developed. And I got that from the International Rice Institute. Okay, which, hold on a second. Yeah. We've got perhaps some of the viewers are, are uh, we, we lost them here. Um, because we were talking about the Abu Sayyaf, and, and we started talking about some of the, the strategic moves that well, why would they? Why would anybody join a crazy radical group? It's because they're so desperate they have nothing to live for. Why would somebody want to blow themselves up and commit suicide because they have nothing to live for and life is just misery and suffering? So when I first went into the area in 2002, was was after the whole 9-11 thing, and I sat down with the elders at, of, of the community. The week before I got there, there had been some Seventh-day Adventists that tried going door-to-door, -door, proselytizing, and they got right. their heads cut off and put on poles in the marketplace. And people were asking, well, how can you go down there and do this? Well, I had just worked six years in Afghanistan at a time when even the Taliban, not, okay. not consistently in Afghanistan, but I was working out of the U.S. Congress so you can see this isn't just something that that was made up on the spur of the moment. I had a lot of years to kind of been doing other things for 20 some odd years before that. So there was a lot of preparation and experience that went into the model that we're working with. And the one thing that I found in these cases where you have suicide bombers and you have child soldiers and all of this is even though in most cases in terms of natural resources the communities are very rich. They, those resources are never properly developed. The poverty is insufferable, and any radical can go in and recruit somebody to do something self-destructive because they have nothing to live for. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are watching Asia in Review, and we are talking with Philippine insurgent expert Al Santoli, and what you don't know yet is that this man is a very successful peace mediator and conflict resolution expert in the Muslim-held areas of the southern Philippines. He is the world expert on the Philippine insurgency. And uh, at the outside of this program, Al, we were talking about these various groups. And we started to talk about the Abu Sayyaf, and I want to use that because you've already given the, the, the viewers a hint uh, or an overview as to the, the kind of the, the broad framework of this uh, multi-generational counterinsurgency strategy that your foundation, Asia America Initiative, has developed. Uh, and so watching this program, there are experts and analysts uh, um, um, from the, the, the American and foreign militaries. There are uh, faculty members at various institutions watching this program. And someone out there in the back of their mind is saying, well, does this actually work? And so let's go back to the Abu Sayyaf. You use the word had, meaning they're no longer in existence. No, they don't really. exist. They don't exist. So was Let's talk about the elimination of this one group for a moment as a transition into talking about some more of the work that Asia America Initiative does because it seems to me that, that the, the Abu Sayyaf have been eliminated and they have been eliminated how? Okay. First, I'm going to clarify that violence hasn't stopped but it's been reduced. Organizations are basically gangs. The Abu Sayyaf was a gang that was created by the Pakistanis in Afghanistan-Pakistan border of disaffected youth from poor families that went to fight a holy war in Afghanistan. And what Filipinos will say is, well, your government created them just like they did the Al-Qaeda because they were trained by the Saudis 
and the Pakistanis in Afghanistan where your country was supporting this kind of thing happening against the Russians. So we say, okay, let's put all that aside and not debate that okay. because it's irrelevant okay. to I tell that to people. That's irrelevant for the here and now. The, the, the critical thing is the corruption, the poverty, and the other issues that, 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 that foment this violence. So the Abu Sayyaf as a group was only about, I'd say not more than, maybe 20 people and their cousins. Okay, so hold on now. So you're talking about... 100 people total? Maybe about 100 to 120. And was there ever an al-Qaeda link? There was order? an Afghanistan-Pakistan link. But again, when you're talking about things like al-Qaeda, again, if you talk to any counterinsurgency or terrorism expert, they'll tell you that a lot of things are elusive. We, we might give a name to people and call them they're part of a, quote, organization. Saudi intelligence might have, and it was Saudi intelligence that created al-Qaeda, might have a select group of people that are their boys or their mullahs who take orphans. And, and if you look at what happened, how al-Qaeda was formed, because I watched them being formed, um, unfortunately, they were orphans or they had lost their fathers in the war against the Russians. The Saudis and the Pakistanis separated them from their mothers, put them in camps that were religious schools because there were no schools for them and you had at least 25 to 30 percent of the Afghan population as refugees at that time. Many of the kids didn't have fathers. Did they, did they do the same technique with the Filipinos? Well, the Filipinos went from poor families in the, in the Philippines to these areas, as people did from many countries, to fight the Russians for salvation because it was considered a holy war just to save fellow Muslims from the communists. This is the jihad in Afghanistan? Correct, correct. Okay. That okay. was the lure. It wasn't a bad thing, okay. but it turned into a bad thing because it was manipulated by the Pakistanis and the Saudis for their idea of a worldwide caliphate. Okay, okay. Directed against the West, directed against India, and directed against governments in Southeast Asia. They can't succeed unless living conditions are so bad that people will want to join them and, and do things that are, you know, completely inhuman in my, in my concern. So in the camps in Pakistan for the boys that become Talibans or Al-Qaeda's, they're separated from their mothers. Okay. They're told by the religious teachers in the school that their obligation is to hate people and kill people. They often have sexual abuse by these religious so-called teachers. Okay. So the boys don't even know their own sexuality. And if you look at the story, the movie, The Kite Runner, a little bit of that is implied in terms okay. of the homosexual rape and that stuff. And then they say, God told us to do this. And oh, by the way, your mother couldn't protect you. And they develop a hatred of women. So if you look at one thing I used to look at, which who were the worst of the thought police and of the brutal people that patrolled the streets of Kabul while the, the um, uh, Taliban were in charge with the Al-Qaeda and with the Pakistan military, the guys dressed like drag queens. They had long nails, false nails, they wore eye makeup, they wore jewelry because they didn't know their own, it's just like the profile if you're doing forensic psychology on a mass murderer, okay, and you'll find okay. some place in that mass murderer's life there was some kind of rape, and they have always had hatred. And what the Taliban's did and the, the Al-Qaeda did was tell the boys it's your mother's fault. It's not our fault that we raped you, it's your mother's fault because she couldn't protect you. So now these Filipino boys that have been through this now, I'm not saying they were all raped, but they were influenced by these brutal, inhumane people. Okay. That if I don't use the word evil so often, in this case, I'll say anybody that brutalizes a child to become a murderer to me is a very evil person. Okay. And that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with, in that category of people, we're dealing with sheer evil. So we get these boys back to the Philippines. This group, Abu Sayyaf, is formed. 9-11 occurs. And uh, we've got maybe... Well, separate from 9-11. I understand. They were already kidnapping people. All right, so they, they're in existence from roughly when? Under the name Abu Sayyaf. Early... Now, see, the Afghan War ended in, in 89. 
okay. roughly 89. They started going back home probably the early 1990s. So okay. you say the first kidnappings of uh, people down in Lamitan and uh, other areas was probably in that period of the early 1990s. Okay, so we got we got kidnappings, executions, beheadings throughout the 1990s. We get the the 9/11, uh, uh, and uh, we you just said a minute ago that the Abu Sayyaf totals a very small group, maybe 20, 30 with with their cousins. Of, with cousins, their cousins. It's always like okay, if you can make some money, you got somebody kidnapped. Then people want to join in because okay. if they get, say, $50,000 as ransom for somebody, they share it around. And sometimes the police get a cut, sometimes the army gets a cut because it becomes a, uh, what do you say, a growth industry? Sure, okay. That, that all these people get involved in. And so it also then ties into local corruption. Uh, there was, when this came to a head, is when American missionary couple were kidnapped at a resort. And um, there became an emphasis this is two, the Burnhams. This was the Bur Mr. and Mrs. Burnham. 2001, 2002, and that 2000. Range? About okay. 2000, they were kidnapped. And they were being held on Basilan Island. At that point, because already this 9 11 thing has, has happened, or it's about, to happen. it's about to happen, and uh, the U.S. Army Special Operations, or we'll say Joint Special Operations, was sent down to Basilan to do something called the Balakatan operation, which was intended to help to train counter counterterrorism and also to rescue the missionaries. What did they do vis-a-vis -vis the Abu Sayyaf? Well, this was uh, principally uh, search and destroy in a okay. way. Okay. But then they added to it a civil military affairs component because they wanted communities to do the hearts and mind thing so that they could get information about where are the kidnappers and to try to, to isolate the kidnappers, the kidnap group who would have been Abu Sayyaf. Um, and, and they gradually over a period of time eliminated say the top 12 or top 20 leadership. So those guys that came back from Afghanistan are no longer alive. I okay. don't think there's any of them that are still okay, alive Okay, hold today. on now. So what you're saying is that the, the combined efforts of the U.S. military and the armed forces of the Philippines yes. eliminates the, the original group that came back from Afghanistan. Okay. They were very small. Okay. And they weren't accepted by their own community, largely because, A, they were seen as being alien from their own culture. B, because they brought too much suffering on their own people, because every time these kidnappings would happen, then the Philippine military would do operations. People's homes got burned down, some innocent people were killed, et cetera, et cetera, and people were not happy. Third um, was that they did not come from prominent families. They came from the island of Holo, many of them, the ones who went to Afghanistan. So lower, lower class in the Philippines. Well, they would say, oh, yeah, that guy, you know, it's uh, Commander Robot, like they had names like Commander Robot. It's the Philippines, and everyone has weird nicknames. But Commander Robot, oh yeah, he used to drive for my uncle, or uh, okay. uh, John Jelani used to be the cook for my grandfather. I mean, these were not prominent people. Okay, the so prominent the people defend, stay and defend their own islands. They don't go someplace to become, uh, even on jihad, they, they feel their place is to stay, to defend their culture, always defend for 500 years since the time of the Spanish. Their mission has been as warriors to defend their culture. Okay, so I, well, here's what I don't understand, Al. Mm -hmm. You just explained that the the leadership, if you will, and, mm -hmm. and the hardcore trainees that return from Pakistan are eliminated through the joint efforts of the American military and the armed forces of the Philippines. Uh, they were eliminated in terms of one by one picked off. Okay. However, at the same time, can they recruit? Okay, so that comes to my next question there. The most insurgent operations, you know, they, they talk about it like you're, you're, you, you're 
cut the head of the snake off and several other heads uh, uh, appear. Why didn't that happen with the Abu Sayyaf? Why, did, why can you use the word had? They're no, they're no longer around. I mean, what happened because, there? Because that was a very small group. There's still violence and there's still stuff that goes on. But that name will be used, but it's not the people who were originally referred to by that name because of the, the poverty, the rivalries between political factions, etc. So while that was going on, um, Asia America Initiative was formed. Okay, so why, why wasn't the Abu Sayyaf able to recruit other replacements and the organization continue to this day? Because, why not? Because Asia and America Initiative, with the support of the Philippine government and many kind, generous private people from the United States and other countries, created situations where we improved the schools, we brought public health, and things that helped people to believe they had a future. So the other guys who had come back from Afghanistan could not easily recruit them. I'll give you a for instance. In 2005, when the remainders, whoever was at that time left from the so-called Abu Sayyaf, uh, put out the word publicly that I was a dead man. Okay. That they were going to. I could see me. why, because you you were you were in the middle our, between our all schools, the communities. Our schools had a 99 percent retention rate. 99. Usually the kids will drop out. The boys will drop out of school, fourth or fifth grade. There's no books. There's no chairs. There's really not much work for them to go to, but they can get a gun. And the Abu uh, the, the Abu Sayyaf puts a price on your head. They say. No, they didn't. They, 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 they would take care of it themselves. Santoli is a dead man. Yeah, that I'll never leave. Okay, and so how come you're sitting here today? Because the entire community protected me. Okay, so explain that to our viewers, because I don't understand. How does that work? It worked because over a period of time, I was accepted as part of the community because they knew that I didn't have to be there, and everything that I did was for the benefit of the community. Um, I never tried to convert anybody, and they knew they couldn't convert me. And that was our understanding, that we would be friends, but there would be nothing to try to change anybody. Because when I first started, what I had learned in Afghanistan, when you're dealing with especially traditional Muslim cultures, with anybody for that matter, it's, it's a matter of respect. You meet with the elders of the community, sure. and you find out what it is. I knew, different from the military, I can't control anything. Okay, right. So I have to work with people. I can't tell people what to do. Okay. Um, I have no protection except that the community chooses to protect me. So on one hand, I'm showing confidence and trust in them because I'm putting my life in their hands. And they're trusting me because they're letting me help to develop the schools, which means I'm shaping the minds of their kids. So that means it's, so a, it's a mutual trust. Right. And so the community then becomes your bodyguard. That's exactly. So what happened is on one occasion when there were a lot of kids dying of malaria, we brought in some oral rehydration salt. Oral rehydration salt is a little pack of salt and minerals that you put into a glass of water or a baby bottle, and it replenishes the fluid in the system so kids don't die from high fever. We saved about 100 kids, and one of the kids we saved, by coincidence, was the daughter of the commander of the main guerrilla group in the province, who, who was not crazy and was a good guy. And which which group? The MNLF. MNLF. Yeah, okay. and was basically fighting to defend the community from corruption and all that stuff. And they had a peace treaty with the government, too. So the soldiers said, fine. You know, I mean, the government side said, fine. It's really great that you can communicate with them because, hey, we're technically in a peace treaty anyway, so there's no laws being undermined. We don't have a problem with right. this in terms of national policy because it's supportive of national policy, which is reconciliation, so I could do that. But I got the word that I was now part of that guerrilla commander's family because I had uh, saved the life of his youngest daughter. Okay. All the doctors did, I didn't. I just basically helped provide some okay. stuff to enable the doctors to get the job done, and the doctors were the local doctors. So, so you you virtually become for these these uh, radical insurgents, you become an untouchable. Not, not radical. Well, okay, for the other guys. So what happened is, the people from my adopted family went to the house of went to the families of the, of the of the criminals 
and said to them, Do you know you've just issued a threat against my brother? And do you know that the imam has him here as the guest? And do you know that if you should touch a hair on his head, that everybody knows where you live? Ladies and Enough gentlemen, said. ladies and gentlemen, that relationship is better than Kevlar. Yeah. Better than Kevlar. Yeah. You know, Al, I want to um, uh, just summarize for for our audience here. Um, we talked about a number of insurgent groups. We talked about the Abu Sayyaf. Mr. Santoli has told us about the elimination of that group by the joint efforts of the armed forces of the Philippines and the American military, uh, and and a uh, and an unspoken uh, kind of a strategic partnership that was never written. And uh, no, the American military was never friendly to us. And they, but but it was it was kind of a strategic partnership in the sense that what what was happening yeah, was yeah because I never I because as a as myself a veteran and a hundred percent disabled veteran my intent is that if we can do our work and I work with the indigenous people it prevents American soldiers from having to be there and it protects their kids since most of the soldiers are married. So what my point so, yeah, so, yeah. so my point is here is that the Abu Sayyaf maybe the let's call it the head the head was eliminated, but its ability to 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 reform, to recruit, to rebuild mm -hmm. itself was effectively blocked by your your foundation uh, with the the programs and the model that it created mm -hmm. so that that now you can use the word had, except that the Abu Sayyaf name today we see it, it in will the persist, newspaper. and anybody will use that name because it's a name that scares people. So, if I wanted to incorporate some violent act, I could say I am Abu Sayyaf's because it would then imply I was bigger than I really was, and it would get me a lot of real good cheap publicity. But who uses that name today? Uh, basically, criminals. It has nothing to do with being extremist Muslims or anything like that. It's basically people who are kidnappers. Some of them could be family members like cousins or something of some of the old Abu Sayyaf people. But the main group that's the one fighting with the government is the MILF. And um, uh, it's not the Abu Sayyaf. So if you're going to draw a lesson from this as a blueprint model for counterinsurgency, um, you could say that it was a private governmental partnership, A because our organization is not government, and I am sure. not government, even though it took me three years to convince people that I wasn't CIA. <laughs> uh, All right. Two, All right. Okay. Okay. Two is that you need to have a strong civil affairs component okay. to be able to work with people in the fact that they know their lives mean something. Because if people feel that their lives are no better than animals or less than animals to the government, they'll fight the government. Okay. Okay. Number three is that these guerrilla groups can be beaten. And this also, if you look at what the Marines did during the same period, 2005, 2006, I was working with U.S. Marines down in Quantico, Virginia, at the command and staff at College and War Fighting School, with the guys that were coming back from Fallujah and the Sunni Triangle. And coincidentally, at the same time as, as I was working this, they were finding that if they were able to work with the tribal leaders in the Sunni Triangle, that they could isolate the foreign Al Qaeda okay. who were killing the most okay. Marines. All right, I got you. I got you. So, so we had convergences happening, and those convergences, even though you know I am a military veteran, but I do this as a civilian and a humanitarian. I do not do this as a mercenary. I don't do this under a government contract. We haven't taken a lot of publicity in the past because I was concerned about the safety of my staff. And the larger profile you get, the more of a kidnapping sure. target you become, or these people want to kill you. Um, like I say, with the time when, I mean, you know, I had more than one death threat against me. But having, having been myself a soldier in combat and having experienced a lot of places in the world that are not exactly stable, my feeling is you have to use good instincts. You, not anyone can do this. This is not something that is easy to do. But if you use good judgment, if you have some experience, and most importantly, you have the trust of the local people, you have a kind of inherent, inherent um, protection that 
no matter how many guns I carried, and I don't carry a gun because it wouldn't do me any good. A sniper could pick me off. I would never see the bullet. Let, Al, um, let, me, let, let, me, let me try something on you here. Of all these insurgent groups in the Philippines, mm -hmm. um, we, we've spent a fair amount of time in this program talking mm -hmm. about the Abu Sayyaf. And it's clear to me from your discussion that your, your foundation, your work as an NGO in the southern islands of the Philippines has, 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 has played a really critical role in the elimination of, of one of those insurgent groups. So yes. that we know that the model that you've developed is successful and will work. Yeah, uh, in did, certain, I, did in, I misstate in, something? In certain environments, because every environment is different. I think if we went right now into Afghanistan, the situation there is so poison. It is so out of control because of the drug dealing, because of all the mistakes that were made over the past 10 years, that we would be in great jeopardy and we might not succeed because the, 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 the conditions are not the appropriate. If we went into, for instance, I, I, I love the work that I do and I'll defend it at any time, but we also have to know when it would work and when it wouldn't work. If you went into southern Thailand where there's the heavy animosity between the Sultanate of Patani in the south of Thailand and the government, largely because of the brutality of the Thaksin Shinawatra regime toward the local people, guys were, and my, I'm convinced that guys came back from Pakistan and have led for now since 2003 or four this insurgency that the Thais still don't know who the leaders are. But every week, if you look in the Thai newspapers, there's murders, assassinations, sabotage. In the southern Thailand. In region. southern Thailand. If we went in to that environment, into the jaws of a lion, you know, it's always God's will, but chances are we wouldn't come out alive. I would approach that differently. I'd approach it, approach it from an area that's out here, that you work your way in, that you work with the communities where people know each other, where people have relatives, where the religious leaders were trained in the same schools, and you have this kind of uh, community affinity and let your reputation grow. Well, that's what you've done in the Philippines, right? But I went right into the job okay. line. We've got to talk about some different things here, and let's move along in this program. Um, uh, I have a little cartoon book here um, that uh, has a, a it has little games and things in it and it's the, thor it's the story of three children one is a Christian, one is a Muslim and one is a hill tribe who have never talked to each other before until illegal loggers came into their community and started destroying the environment which caused floods and it caused big fires and so the three children decided that they had to work together to defeat these illegal loggers. Okay, so viewers stay with us on this because this is really important because what you are looking at is a piece of evidence as to the multi-generational counterinsurgency strategy that is working in the southern Philippines that has been developed by Mr. Santoli and his foundation. And how does this work? What's the significance of this? Well, the idea is we're always thinking that peace and uh, security mm -hmm. are a generational process. That what we can do today is try to stop people from really destroying everything. But we're looking to be training the children who will be tomorrow's leaders. When you're having problems with culture and religious uh, communities, uh, having long-term resentments of each other, uh, we try to find ways for people to work together. Part of it is the schools. If you've got kids from every family and clan going to a public school, you're not showing any favoritism or bias or prejudice because you're helping the school. And people say, well, who's your mediators? Well, our mediators are the PTA. Okay, okay. The parents sure. will do things for the school. And the other thing is, how do you stop corruption? Well, the way we stop, we help to stop corruption because the warlords have their kids in those schools too, is we defy the warlords to steal from their own children without being confrontational. We can be sweeties, we can have smiley faces, but if their kids are coming home happy that they finally have books, that they finally have a toilet, that they finally don't have worms in their stomach, 
and the, the people see it. Are you going to steal from your own kid and, and do something that would hurt your child? Because one thing in certain communities is people do love their children. And so we, use, we utilize the element of family love as a community basis for peace mediation. The kids learn how to work with each other. And, and my staff, this is, will shock people, but the average age of my staff is 23 to 24 years old. They are incredible young people who have courage, they have idealism, uh, they're not deterred, and they work largely. We have a thousand youth volunteers in these very difficult areas of conflict. How did that start? It started in the place where people were hacking each other to death with machetes, and my, my um, country director, who is now 28 years old, a young woman who's half Christian, half Muslim, um, has her advocacy unity between people and uh, we went in by ourselves with load a load of relief supplies and when the young people at two colleges St. Michael's which is a Catholic college and um, Mindanao State University which is public with a lot of Muslim kids saw that we were doing this and going by ourselves one night we got back from the first day and there were a hundred students waiting for us at St. Michael's uh, the auditorium at St. Michael's and they said, hey, you're not going back tomorrow alone. Mm -hmm. We're coming with you. Wow. So, and I, that was, like, incredible. Al, we are, are going to have some very disappointed viewers if we don't cover a couple more points because this program is almost over. You are watching Asian Review with the world expert on the Philippine insurgency, Mr. Al Santoli. Um, Al, what is this book? It's printed by the Armed Forces of the Philippines, and it's called The Soldier's Handbook on Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law. What is this? This has been a project. It's a long-term project by the Philippine military that they asked for some assistance from some non-governmental organizations, like we were, you know, Asia American Initiative was the only non-Filipino organization involved, but my staff is mostly Filipino, so almost all Filipino, so they consider us to be part of the whole community, um, where we worked with lawyers uh, from the armed forces and from, I think, uh, UN, uh, the UNICEF was involved in this too, in creating a handbook for soldiers that are operating in areas where there's uh, civil wars going on based on religion or culture to be able to conduct themselves in a way by which there would not be rampant human rights abuses. And it's been adopted and now all Filipino officers have to read this, or they're given a copy whether they read it or not, I don't know. Um, and at the Philippine Military Academy, this is one of their textbooks for all the young, op young people that are going to become military officers. It's endorsed on the back by the president of the country and also president by... President Benigno... Aquino. Aquino, yeah. And also, um, you know, same thing with this, our comic book, Kapa uh, 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 it means peace in Philippine, and the three kids have, their names are divided up. And uh, so it's, it's a mythological, fictional uh, inspiration for the kids. With, with bread, my, and also this is original. All of this was created by 20 artists from my organization, multimedia artists. They're doing cartoons for television based on this and other things. And the amazing thing is we're doing this with no government funding. Wow. You know, we have time for one more quick topic, uh, uh, Al, and I, I just, I, I would like to, to ask you, uh, just give us 45 seconds Mm. Of what's the what's the influence of China in this region and and the the whole insurgency situation? What what is China's involvement here? Uh, China needs food, water, and energy, and it's targeting the Philippines and other neighboring countries for those things. They're trying to buy off officials. They're flooding in uh, methamphetamines, crystal meth, other things to destabilize communities. Is that something and they're just doing to make money? The uh, crystal no, meth? No, it's to destabilize places so people can't resist them. Uh, they're buying off politicians, uh, and they're also building military bases right off the coast. Their maps show their border going right up to the border of Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, Brunei. They're claiming all the water based on Ming Dynasty maps from the 15th century as, uh, as their territory, okay. and that we have no right, no one has a right 
to say that anything in that water is not China's. It's, it's, it's a big problem that's right over the horizon. How do you know this crystal meth problem comes from China? Uh, because it's already been investigated by officials who are really officials and not private speculators. And it's traced back through to where it's in China? To Chinese military bases. PLA? Yeah. And everybody knows that the materials for meth, a lot of it comes from, whether it's on the Burmese-China border that floods into Thailand or whether it's on the, the, the South China Sea and it goes into other countries, it comes out of Chinese military bases. Quick, quick last question. China buying up food supplies in the Philippines and exporting to their they own country? They want to buy the land so that they, they've already done that. They bought Del Monte in the Philippines. Del Monte is Del, owned? By China. How about Dole? On Dole, not. Del Monte Dole, is. Dole, but Del Monte and the food goes to China. We've had to do gardens in the schools on the Del Monte plantation because the kids aren't eating. The kids have malnutrition because all the food goes to China. We are going to end this program in just a moment. I am David Day for Asian Review. You've been watching an incredibly fascinating discussion with the world expert on the Philippine insurgency, Mr. Al Santoli. I've learned a lot. I hope you've learned a lot. And uh, Al, thank you so much for, for joining us and joining Think Tech here uh, in this program. We appreciate it so much. Well, thank you, David. I, I truly appreciate the opportunity. Good night.